Okay, so uh, welcome back, everybody. Uh, this session is the, the last session of today and is on the PN post AGB connection. So uh, previously, we were going to have um, a sort of introductory talk by Henri Boffin covering a number of small, a number of aspects of the of this topic, but unfortunately Henri can't make it today. So, so I'm going to quickly put up a couple of slides to cover a few of the points that Henri would have mentioned before we go into the more specific uh, sciencey talks. So I'm very pleased to be chairing this session because it's undoubtedly the most important of all the sessions that we will have this week, because uh, even in Pachinski's paper, he pointed out that PN or post common envelope planetary nebulae are easily the most important objects for constraining the, uh, the common envelope phase. And why is that? It's because these are the principally the only systems where we can see the immediate after effects or the immediate after products of the, of the common envelope. We can see the binary itself just as it has left the common envelope phase. It has not evolved, it has not relaxed, nothing has happened to it, as well as the ejected envelope, which is the the planetary nebula. So in that way, they are they are really unique in uh, being probes of the of the common envelope phase. <clears throat> so Pajinsky's paper came in 1975 in the IAU, and the first example of a post common envelope central star came one year after in this um, paper by Howard Bond, comparing the catalog of binary stars to a catalog of PN and finding that uh, there was a match in the central star of Abel 63 which it turns out is a sort of archetypal post-common envelope planetary nebula for a number of reasons. The central star is a white dwarf or a pre-white dwarf and a main sequence star in a short, roughly one day orbit. The inclination of the binary matches the inclination of the sort of barrel shaped central nebula. Uh, the nebula is not spherical, it's bipolar. It has these, um, polar outflows, which you can see in the top right and top uh, bottom left corner of this, uh, of this image, where these outflows are kinematically older than the central regions by about a thousand years. Uh, the central star, the companion to the central star, I've said is a main sequence star, but it's uh, inflated. Its radius is about three times what you would expect for a typical main sequence star of, uh, of that mass. So these are all properties that I guess we might come back to, might to later as being archetypal amongst central stars. So I mentioned that the inclination uh, of the central binary matches with the inclination of the, of the nebula. So the symmetry axis of the nebula is perpendicular to the plane of the binary. It turns out that for all the systems that we've managed to measure, both of those inclinations, they all match up one-to-one -one exactly as you would expect. Uh, so in all cases, we can say that the, the envelope is ejected into the orbit plane, just as you would, you would hope. These inflated uh, secondaries, we find them in approximately all um, main sequence companions, apart from one example, where that example is roche lobe filling, so it can't be inflated. But in all the other cases, they are, they are inflated. And this seems to be a consequence of mass transfer could be to, a little bit to do with irradiation, but mainly we think it's to do with mass transfer, probably before the common envelope, because as we, as also mentioned in an introductory talk, the amount of mass transfer during shouldn't be, or accretion during the common envelope shouldn't be sufficient. <clears throat> Similarly, here's another example where we have another uh, indication of mass transfer. If you look at the central star, the companion is... Um, a low mass main sequence star, heavily polluted in carbon, a dwarf carbon star, an example that um, uh, also again mentioned in, uh, in her introduction. So these seem to be the sort of common envelope equivalents of barium stars. So barium stars being the much wider period, chemically com um, contaminated binaries. These dwarf carbon stars, there have been a handful of examples this year of uh, naked dwarf carbon stars being shown to be in post common envelope binaries. But this in the central star of the necklace is the, uh, uh, a really key example because we can see that it's a uh, post-common envelope by being inside the, 
Pn. <clears throat> we also find a lot of double degenerates. So these should be much more difficult to find because uh, they shouldn't be so photometrically variable because you don't have the large temperature differential to provide um, a strong irradiation effect. But nonetheless, we find that maybe 10 to 20% of all of our post-common envelope uh, binary central stars are double degenerates. This has important implications, not only because there shouldn't be so many of them, uh, but if we are finding 10 or 15%, there should be even more because they're difficult to, to identify. So this has important consequences for population synthesis and probably for the formation of, uh, of other post-common envelope phenomena, mainly uh, type 1a supernovae. And finally, just to round this off, I think again, Ursula mentioned uh, this is a sort of key question, that we have these proto or pre-planetary nebulae, which seem to be the sort of um, post-AGB transition objects from the AGB towards the PN phase, where the central star has left the AGB and is evolving towards the, the white dwarf phase, but still isn't hot enough to ionize the surrounding material. And even though we find roughly 20% of all, plan all planetary nebulae contain a post-common envelope binary, uh, so far, the fraction amongst pre-planetary nebulae is far less than that. In fact, there's been no bona fide example of a post-common envelope central star inside a pre-planetary. A couple of candidates, some where it seems as though they're probably quite wide, they just have a composite spectra, or one example that was discovered, in fact, last week, where they managed to measure the orbital period, but uh, it's in this sort of uh, graveyard where it doesn't seem to be post-common envelopes much wider. Or the one example that is held up all the time as being a, an example of a post-common envelope is probably just uh, uh, pulsationary. So that begs the question, do post-common envelope stars evolve too quickly to be seen in this phase? Do, when you throw off the envelope in a, in a common envelope, does the, the nucleus evolve too quickly for us to spot it in this phase? Or is there something observational there that prevents us from seeing these objects? Or are these pre-planetary nebulae, in fact, the different class of objects that won't evolve into our planetary nebulae, 20% of which are, are post-common envelope? Because as uh, Tomek pointed out in his paper a couple of years ago, their properties in a number of uh, a number of properties are actually very similar to luminous red novae, which we'll hear about uh, later on this week. So those are just a couple of um, conversation starters, maybe that we can come back to in the discussions. Now we're getting into some more specifics, uh, beginning with uh, a talk by Guillermo. So are you here, Guillermo? Hi. So please go ahead and, uh, and share your screen. Again, just as the, in the previous session, I'll give you a two minute warning when you have uh, two minutes left. Well, thank you. Shalom everybody. This uh, <clears throat> collaboration is done with Ronald Tam and Paul Ricker, both from Illinois. It's a beautiful collaboration. So to start with, uh, we already agree, I think, in the community that rotating single star cannot form bipolar planetary nebulae. So we need uh, another way to redistribute the angular momentum into the equator. So we know that common envelope evolution can do this for us after a wind roche lower flow and a roche lower flow uh, phase. We have a common envelope evolution and then the cell regulative phase. In these two sections, we are going to calculate the ejecta and, oh, my dog, sorry. Uh, this is the plane where we are going to be looking at. So first, we are going to assume that uh, the central star, the primary, is already naked by the spiraling and is hot enough to produce a line-driven wind. This is the first approximation that we are dealing with. So what we did is uh, you, you, we used the Paul Ricker and Ronald Town simulation with flash. Um, doing in 3D, the whole study is very complicated and very time consuming. So we decided to use two dimensional to this study. 
and uh, we set up the two dimensions uh, from the 3D calculations. The good thing is that uh, the flash code, for example, goes up to 10 to the 13 centimeter, but for planetary nebulae, we have to go to five order of magnitude. So we need to expand the grid with the flow. And this can be done with this uh, code in, in spherical coordinates. So here, basically, we put uh, a line-driven wind that is in the market, like Basiliadis and Wood. And here, outside the outer boundary, we put the previous wind, the red giant or the AGB wind. So you can go to the in more detail in the paper, but basically, uh, in the, independent of what kind of model you put for a red giant, which is the original of Paul Ricker's uh, model, or one mass for the AEB or five, 2.5 masses, you get all, always a planetary nebula, which is bipolar, basically. And from this study, we learned that you can have multi lobes, like in the case of M29. And this is not for M29, of course, but uh, especially, for example, comparing to this uh, nebula, that this is at least in binary, no doubt that. Is uh, you have eight hours of uh, period, you can see that they are multi load, but uh, actually the one that you see here, we see is the outer load. Mm, the key here is that photoionization is doing the, the, the role here for making multi logs. In the case of the schema or the cat side, for example, you have a bipolar with elliptical inside, it doesn't matter what you have. You have a equator with a lot of mass that you can evaporate. You can evaporate by the ionization from. So this is injecting a gas that is colliding with the line driven wind. And this is the reason why you get uh, multi lobes in general. <clears throat> so you don't, you don't need two ejections of com or two common envelope scenarios. The next part, we were discussing the, the circumbinary disk, but I don't have too much time, so I will skip this part. You can read the paper, it's easy to read. And I will skip to the third part, which is the most interesting, which is the launching of magnetic winds and jets. For that, <clears throat> we did, of course, some approximations. First of all, from the 3D flash computation, uh, the flash computation didn't include magnetic field, we did a several studies with the binary evolution code, which is basically the same physics than MESA by Norbert Langer group. So uh, we saw that, of course, most of the magnetic field inside of the star is, is toroidal. So what we decided is to include uh, a, 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 small, a, a small toroidal field in the ejecta, only 5% from the partition value, and a maximum of 500 gauss just to be conservative. We don't, want to include very high magnetic fields. But once that you form already the circumbinary disk, this gas is being compressed to the equator. So the toroidal field as well is compressed to the equator. Then you, you now get toroidal field of 10 to the four. Uh, actually it's 15,000 gauss over here. So those fields are already important which is, we don't have probably this situation in, in star formation, but here you have already magnetic field. Probably even if you put a dynamo, it's even better, but already with the ejecta magnetic field, the ejecta, I mean, the field that goes in the ejecta is already done. Here you have a lot of magnetic field. So uh, actually running the simulation, you cannot do anything uh, because the toroidal field is stable. There is no friction, there is no torque. So nothing is going to happen even you run this simulation for 10,000 years. So we need, because it's two dimension. In, in three dimension, we think that what is happening is the B5, the toroidal field, is going to be subject to instability like, like, um, like the, um, oh, I forgot the name. Anyway, uh, you have uh, turbulence, convection, magnetic buoyancy, sorry, the parking instability. So what we are going to do is, uh, if we dip, depart from a toroidal field, we are going to put a small uh, poloidal field coming out from the toroidal field in this way. We just put only 0.5% of the toroidal field 
in the radial and theta component. So then we have a beef magnetic field, toroidal, and a small poloidal magnetic field. This is similar, in part, uh, this is quite similar to the Blanford and Payne picture. Instead, this is the radial direction and we are going in the phi direction. But it's similar, you have the lines coming out in and out of the wind. So, this, in this simulation you are going to see this movie, we didn't include any injection of momentum or energy, only gravity. What you are going to see only is the role of gravity. So this is a period today for the binary and a separation of 0 0.006. So here, the binary is here. Uh, um, and this is the circumbinary disk. So let's start the movie. So first you see that it's coming like an X wing from the disk. This is, uh, this is launched by magnetic pressure. It's, it's subalbenic, the ejection. I will explain a little bit later. And then after a while, the, the accretion start to start bigger and bigger and bigger. And there is a moment that cannot, cannot handle so much accretion that breaks into the polar direction by the hoop stress and form micro jet and white jet. I, I will explain now this. I call, I call this is like an S wind. Then this is a narrow, narrow jet in the middle. And then later we have this, this is the, I call a wide jet. Jet because it's supersonic at superalbenic, but the launching is subalbenic. Uh, what is happening here? Well, in this toy model, you can see that the circumbinary, this is actually, I mean, you, this gap that is inside of the circumbinary gap is producing a, a strong centrifugal barrier. This centrifugal barrier, if we imagine that the, this is a, is a, it's like a piston. Now with the poloidal field, you have torques and friction in the disc, so you can accrete very efficiently, like the uh, Bondi and uh, sorry, uh, bulbous and Howley instability. So when you have the centrifugal barrier and you push the gas inside, the gas is quite uncompressible by the magnetic field. So part of the wind escapes through the pole and part is going to be uh, accreted by, it's, it's hard to accrete. So there is a fraction of the gas that goes in front of wind. And actually uh, you have here, you can see here that this is subalbenic. Uh, we have some in the phi direction in the velocity, we have some uh, corrotation. And at the end, what you have uh, is a, uh, here you have a subalbenic and superalbenic phases. Uh, uh, is supersonic. So this is a whole uh, wide jet supersonic with 10 to minus seven solar masses per year where the accretion rate is 10 to the five, minus five solar masses per year. Um, you see here the story of the accretion that is coming from minus 10 to the minus eight and then goes and more, more or less saturate in some 10 to minus five. Um, but it's, it's not steady, it's, it's made of bumps in the accretion, also in the ejection, and the mass flow rate is bumpy. And it's similar in part with the taper flow that Balik is, uh, Bruce Balik is working with. Um, the two the, minutes. Yeah, sorry, two minutes, okay. So this is very, very quickly. The micro jets, if we expand the, sorry, if we expand the, the, the flow also, you can see that it's very fast, very, very, very fast to 3000 kilometers per second. So this is what you've, if we now inject this wing in the bipolar uh, structure from the common envelope, this is the kind of structure that you will see. Uh, the, the white wing, the white jet actually for a very beautiful planetary nebula that is completely uh, bipolar. Um, we have compared this with uh, real observations like the ALMA W43A, which is beautiful. I think it's the best picture right now in protoplanetary. This is a jet in CO. And also the Calabash Nebula, you can see here, this is the inner reverse shock. You see also the pumps here, it's very close, it's in shape. And also this fish bowl is a very beautiful reproduce. 
And for the case of la larger uh, period, well, the, 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 you, sh you should expect a slower uh, uh, escape velocity. So the, the, the is similar, but you form first a huge X wing, it's more radiative, like a slow, a slower, and then you form also a, a wide, a narrow jet in the middle. And when you inject this kind of wind in the in the nebula, I mean in the ejecta of the common envelope, you get this type of uh, shapes. These are like elliptical shapes that we think is going to produce in the future with a line-driven wind later on. This kind of uh, this kind of nebula. For example, this can, with a line driven wind, you can probably do this blowout. And when you have more turbulence in the magnetic field, in the white jet, sorry, in the X wing, you probably can form these shapes like our starfish or quadrupolar, which are, I mean, it has to be, of course, we have to do more research on this. But more or less, this is the three paper that we have working on. So you can read it, please. And it's very, very easy to read. And I think I am done, basically. Thank you. Thank you, Guillermo. Do we have any questions? Okay, so I don't see any, so I have one. When you, when you talk about uh, accretion, you were mentioning the accretion rates there. At some point it gets up to 10 to the minus five or something. That's accretion from the disk onto the central stars. So the sort of fallback accretion. That's the accretion from the circumbinary disk to the gap. It, co it can go to the secondary or to the primary or both. Okay. okay. So now we have uh, a question from Adam. Uh, yeah, just this question about the uh, formation of the circumbinary disk, which I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not surprised that one would form, but I still wonder about, because this is so much on the smallest scales of the um, of the common envelope evolution simulations, um, and would be so much dependent on how you're treating interboundary conditions and such. And I guess not, you know. So I guess if you could comment on that, you know, how much we believe these forming, and this is something for the community as a whole, because I think you know all of us who are simulating common envelope evolution, sort of what you end up with in terms of the structure, what what's outflowing, what's falling back. Um, I'd be interested to hear what people think. So Guillermo, if you just want to start with that, like sort of how- Well, uh, probably we have uh, overestimated the cooling, yes, the, the, the cooling time, but it's obvious that the end is going to form uh, at this because it has to cool down. Nature is always cooling down everything. Uh, we have to work with the cooling because we have a, a diabatic transition to radiative conditions. Mm -hmm. So it, it's not easy, it's not easy to treat, but you know, we do numerical simulation, not calcul real calculations. So we, at some point, the, the this is going to be formed. Yeah, but uh, the cooling is important to treat the, the transition from com, com, from adiabatic to radiative steam cooling. No? But anyway, you have to, to, you need, I mean, in nature you have cooling because otherwise you will not see anything. No? But I guess the nature, even, I mean, I would agree that, yeah, there's going to be some cooling occurring at some point, but, you know, you can also, like, um, no, I'm not sure if you were involved in this paper, but I know that Mario was. You know, like you can end up with if the, depending on the time scale for the cooling, you can end up with big fat disks, right? The sort of that have a very hollow, a narrow uh, kind of apple core sort of thing. Um, so, I mean, so part of I guess my question is just in general, you know, even in spite of cooling, just how much material do we think is going to end up being left? being left there? Is it, you know, I mean, the nice thing for you is you're not using inertial confinement, you're using magnetic. So no matter what kind of disc you have, you're going to get the magnetic launching, which is great. Um, but in general, you know, how do, how should we think about the circumbinary discs? Like, you know, from, from, from what we understand, how much mass is going to be there? What are the properties going to be? What can we say? Well, in, in our case, remember that we have 75% of the gas that is bound. Yeah, right. So it's a lot. Right. And also the magnetic field uh, is not uh, allowing to collapse. I mean, it, it preventing the collapse of the disk for some, because the pressure of the magnetic field don't allow 
to go to a very thin disc anyway. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, this certainly seems like one of the frontiers for us is this sort of like, you know, if we want to make this connection with the, 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 the nebula, is to really try and work out over the next few years a better handle on what is left over and what does it look like and what are its properties. I think the ALMA observations are going to give us those yeah, answers. Yeah, yeah. yeah, they're very cool. Okay, Noam, you have a question? Yes, uh, you have more very nice uh, simulations. I have one comment and one short question. The comment is that in some planetary nebulae, we see the jets that were launched before the main envelope ejection. So yeah, some of your results is collimated, fast wind doesn't work. The other work with circumbinary disk might work. Um, this is very nice. And my question is about the power. How much power do you get in the jets compared with accretion power? Actually similar, the kinetic energy and the momentum that you get in the nebula are similar to the observations. So I think- Not an observation with accretion. Say you accrete, uh, say you accrete uh, whatever mass M in, uh -huh. into the central star, one of them, and you launch the jet at the escape velocity. What fraction of the mass of the accreted mass do you launch in the jets? I assume the jets are about the escape velocity from the star. Ah, what is the fraction when between 10 and 100? Around that, I mean, from ten to the one, ten to the two. Oh. Actually, cannot... similar to the to the jet from a stellar formation, I think pretty much. So, ten percent of the energy that you accrete, you blow in the jet. Then, ten percent of the mass that you accrete, you launch in the jet. So, ten to the minus three, ten to the no, minus four. Less than ten percent. Ten percent. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Okay, so just to add to what you what you said, Noam, you were mentioning the pre-common envelope jets that we see. I'm not so sure that they are doing the bulk of the shaping, like in uh, in Guillermo's models, because they, I think they almost certainly come from a phase of uh, wind Roche lobe overflow, mm -hmm. which is probably, I mean, we see from the kinematical ages, it could be a thousand years before the ejection of the central region of the nebula. So quite possibly has little impact on the on the actual uh central region it just removes some mass uh before the before the inspire the inspiral stops so uh next question diego yeah hi guillermo so uh from your magnetic model toroidal what was the difference in like in order to shape w43 and the other one what what was like the key variable in order to have these two different planetary shapings? Uh, in the case of W43A, it's a young nebula. It has 60 years old only. So we are assuming that the toroidal field is quite constant. I mean, it's, it's not disturbed by, by stabilities, king stabilities or turbulence. But in the case of the Calabash Nebula, we assume that instead of the toroidal field behave like one over r is behave like one over r square. So okay. you have more turbulence. So when like uh, Bruce Bali was talking about the, the turbulence, the king stability, whatever. So it's not so well collimated the white jet. Okay. Okay. Great. Thank you. And then along a similar line, we have a question from Lucero in the chat, asking uh, what would be the result if you include more physics in the simulations beyond uh, just gravity? Well, basically it's dominated by magnetic pressure here. So I don't know what physics you want to include, probably better cooling or I don't know, but uh, basically the, the magnetic pressure is doing all the business here. Okay, then final question from Stephen. I was just wondering what the buoyancy time scale is for the base toroidal field when you get up to fields as high as you know 10, 10 kilogauss. Um, since you're including gravity, uh, do fields remain confined and can you actually get the one over our uh, advected structures? I, I don't understand the question, sorry. Well, um, a confined toroidal field is going to be unstable. 
So what's the buoyancy time? Oof, I have no idea. <laughs> we, are, we are not working with that yet. But probably it should be quite fast, I guess. Yeah, but I'm just wondering whether you can actually wind it up fast enough to get that kind of, well, whether you're, you're possibly suppressing some of the instabilities by the, by the symmetry that you're imposing. Okay, we assume that the magnetic field is already wind up inside of the star. Mm -hmm. So we eject the, the envelope, the, most of the, 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 the magnetic field will be a, a steptoroidal. Yeah, but those are unstable by the Taylor instability. But this, I mean, we this is this fair approximation. We need to work a lot of this. Okay. Thanks. Okay, so maybe uh, thanks, Guillermo. Time for us to move on to the next talk. So, Javier, if you can uh, share your screen, please. Uh, sure. Uh, um. Okay. Let me just, can you see the presentation right now? Yes, we can see, thanks. Okay, uh, so we can get it started. Okay, uh, first of all, thank you for the invitation. And let me, and this, uh, in the next 12 minutes, talk about one of this, probably one of the best example of this protoplanetary nebulae. And then later, later on, you decide whether this is re relevant for the um, uh, common envelope community or not. Um, uh, M192, um, also known as Minkowski's footprint, is a bipolar nebula. It's pretty symmetric, except for the uh, asymmetry due to the uh, obscuration of the south lobe. And the parameters of the nebula are pretty well known, the inclination with respect to the, even the inclination with respect to the plane of the sky. This is the, the shape you see, um, um, the, kind of, the kind of image you see in the optical in the continuum. If you have a look at the lines, there you see that there are two shock excite nodes, so some sort of, a, some, some, something like a HH uh, objects. So, so this shock excite that you see in, in, in optical forbidden lines that are expanding at velocities, uh, the projected velocities of 170 kilometers per second. Uh, as for the central star, we don't even know whether it's uh, binary or not. There has been some discrepancies, and so far the latest papers uh, agree that there is no evidence for a companion. And um, there is present mass loss at the base of the um, of the jet uh, near the central star, but the the current mass loss is very tiny, as um, some so a few tends to the mi minus thirteen solar masses per year, and um, but it's very fast. It's something. Uh, 700 to uh, nearly 750 kilometers per second. Um, if you, instead of having a look at the um, optical, you go into radio lines, then is what you see what the, 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 the nebula is made of. You see it, um, uh, you see clearly the nebula in CO, this is this black line, so is the structure of the nebula in CO. Uh, you see also the, the reflected light in the continuum, which match very well the very well the, the shape of the nebula we get in CO and you see now you realize that these these uh, knots are seen right in the middle of the cavities. Um, the molecular gas is distributed in the in the walls of the two lobes and also in a thick equatorial component. Um, as far as we know, everything is in expansion. Uh, there is a linear gradient of 7.4 kilometers per second per second. And it's is the same in all direction, even in the equatorial direction. You can, I mean, this self-similar structure, you can argue with, the, with, I mean, if it's the result of a single quasi-explosive event or a continuing acceleration or whatever, but it's um, growing in all direction with the same gradient. The energy and the momentum we have in this envelope is huge. And that's probably the reason why some people think that this object could be the outcome or something very energetic, probably a, a, a common envelope event or something of that sort. If you assume that the whole thing happened in a very brief amount of time, then the age of the nebula is just uh, 1,200 years old. These are the old observations we have with uh, the former Plateau de Vir interferometer. 
where you can see the two the two lobes, the one in the north and the one in the south, the equatorial structure in the middle. And if you do a velocity position diagram along the symmetry axis, then you get not only the velocity position diagram, but because of this constant velocity gradient, you sort of get the what is the real structure of the nebula. In fact, this, this will be the, the symmetry axis. Sorry, this is the symmetry axis and there will be the cavity on the north and the cavity in the south and the equatorial component. What we have done now is to go for other species because CO is, CO is, is nice. You get probably most of the molecular gas, but it's very insensitive to other things. So we went to Noima, this is the evolution of the Plateau de Vieux, and we observed using two settings, a set of lines, including uh, 13 CO and the rate isotopes, some lines that are tracers of PDR regions or shock or, or ionized regions due to shocks, and several lines of uh, molecules like SO, SO2, and SO, that are uh, primary tracers of shock regions and also of the dense gas. Today, I'm going to concentrate only on the results we have got for SO. Um, if we plot the velocity position diagram we are getting from these new observations. We see that for all CO and isotopes, we sort of get the same uh, velocity position diagram. We see the whole nebula with the very thick equatorial structure. If we have a look at the uh, molecules like SO2 or SO, which are shock tracers and high density tracers, we see that we only get the central equatorial structure plus some condensation right in the middle. Uh, for the PDR tracers, we get uh, something a little bit more complex that I'm not going to get into uh, details now, but we see the central uh, equatorial structure plus the knots that are also emitting in optical lines. This is the first time we see molecules coming from this, these two regions, but we don't see CO. CO is empty right in the middle. We see um, this, uh, HH nodes in um, uh, species that are tracing uh, PDR regions. Uh, Fucking C on, on SO, why studying SO? Well, SO, it's interesting, not, not also because of the properties of the species, because it traces shocks, because it traces dense gas, but it's also interesting because in a ra relatively short uh, range of frequencies, you can get many uh, lines and um, combining all these lines, uh, what we have done is deriving excitation temperatures and real abundances for these species without any modeling, just assu assuming um, that the lines are optically thin, which is kind of okay for this kind of a rare molecule. Um, now I have rotated the map, so the um, asymmetry axis is, is going upright and the equatorial structure is running horizontal. You see that in, in this line, we see the approaching side of the equatorial structure, the receding side, and a central condensation. The same happens for this other line. The structure is pretty, pretty much the same in all the, uh, all the transitions we have detected. We have covered six different transitions with only two non-detections, but this non-detection has been included in the treatment to get better estimation for the density and temperature. Um, what we have done is simply apply the um, what is called the rotational um, uh, these these um, these uh, rotational diagram formalins. You um, knowing the intensity of the different lines, and uh, knowing that for lines of different energy, you can derive the column density and the excitation temperature of the gas at least for this molecule. And I recall that I'm talking about the excitation temperature because the real kinetic temperature, it may not be the same. Um, that depends on whether the molecule is um, uh, sub-excite or not sub-excite, as it may be the case. Uh, we are probably running into some sub-excitation, but not very severe. Um, okay, um, that was the result, sorry, for the, um, for the temperature, you see that we get temperature as low as 5 Kelvin, that was also seen in CO before, and as high as 25, but you see that because of the, you know, the noise due to the observation, the maps are really noisy, and same happens to the column density. 
one thing we we have done uh, to improve the noise is since we have a, um, a structure that is so well um, behave behave we behave so well that is that we have this constant velocity gradient we can in fact recover the information along the line of sight just um, implying the velocity the doppler velocity we see on the gas for that we only need to assume an inclination with respect to the plane of the sky that's the only thing we need and then just we with that uh, in hand we can assign a distance along the line of sight um, as a function is a linear function from the doppler velocity we see and in fact because we suspect that this object is very um, uh, cylindrical symmetric we can play with different angles and we can sort of evaluate which angle give us the best solution in terms of recovering a pretty pretty much cylindrical structure this for example will be the um, skeleton of what will be the um, structure of the nebula in uh, in co using the new 13 co data uh, again the symmetry axis is upright and the equatorial structure is uh, running this direction we can apply we can apply that to the so data uh, in addition um, after we have recovered the three the structure i have imposed cylindrical symmetry and also um, uh, mirror symmetry between the um, north and the south and this is the image you get for the different four different lines where we have detection no no upper limits and then after getting that we can um, we have run an mcmc uh, regression using sensor data to get get better de de determination of both again the physics that the excitation temperature of this uh, species and the column density and this is the result for the temperature uh, again we we go for less than 10 up to 50 kelvin right in the center and for the density we get uh, this is the the density we get in so particles per cubic centimeter that uh, assuming a typical density of 10 to the 6 centimeters uh, 10 to the uh, mine, uh, 10 to the 6 centimeters uh, a cubic centimeter then um, we get uh, fractional abundances of 10 to the minus 7 one curious thing in this map is you see that the, there is a central condensation in SO. This is no, no surprising, but then the, there is kind of this torus, which is not, I mean, with a gap in between. This is, there was kind of surprise for us. And it's a kind of surprise if you compare that with the CO structure, you see that we have a central component, plenty of dense gas. But also this area, which is just outside the densest regions traced by 13CO. But remember that SO is tracing shocks. If you compare not with 13CO, but with OH masers, for that we have taken a very old map by Sequest et al. And we play the same role of C3 reconstruction. Then you see that SO molecules peak right at the place where you see the OH masers probably both OH and SO are being produced by present shocks in this region. We have also observed the continuum. Um, unfortunately for the continuum, we don't have velocity information, but we sort of derive that there is a central component right in the middle, which is not surprising. And then um, kind of torus with a gap in between. If we place this kind of a structure in of SO map, we see the central component here, and that's the place where the continuum peaks. It's just outside the SO region. So summarizing, we, we have used this Noema interferometer to map the SO lines in M182 because we have several lines we can write, we can derive precise temperatures and density for the species without any modeling. Um, we have built 3D models for the gas to improve the noises in this T excitation temperature and column density derivation. And the results is that SO is mainly located at the central core, which is rather warm, and at a torus which is, that is outside the, the densest parts traced by 13CO, but in coincidence with all natures and a little bit inside what we see in the continuum. Um, 
uh, probably, I mean, or 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 ideas go in the direction that, as it happens, also in young in young systems, SO is tracing the dense gas, but it's also tracing where the gas is being um, destroyed and um, the chemistry the chemistry is being altered because of the presence of um, active sharks in in the region. Thanks. That's all. Thank you, Javier. Uh, we have a question from Bruce. Maybe you need to unmute Bruce. If there you're we go. There we go. Hi. Hi, Bruce. Hi, Javier. I hope you're well. Yeah, I'm, I do. Good. Um, what do you know about the dynamic stability of that disk through the center? The disk, then we have no idea. Uh, I mean, Note that the resolution we have with this instrument so far is comparable to what you see that these red dots you see in the continuum, that is the resolution of the instrument. I mean, we know very little about this equatorial parts except that all what you see, all what we see is in expansion. The velocity is still proportional to the radius. Um, there is no signs of rotation and there are no not much more than that. There, there are some anomogeneities, like for example, in the continuum, you see this disk is incomplete in the different lines. Um, if we go to the real maps, um, you see the structure in, the, in this part of the disk is not the same as in the back part. But I mean, we don't have detail enough to tell, to, to answer things like that. Okay. No. Yes, a very nice talk. Uh, can you go please to the last slide and explain us again what we see in the contours? I got lost. And if okay. you can tell us the last slide, yes. Yeah, 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 the, the one with the, everything. Yeah, okay. this one, yeah. And, and if you can tell us what eventually the density ratio between the equatorial, say, plane uh, and, uh, and, you know, the peak that you see above. Okay, let's say the, the color scale is the density we, we see for the SO molecule, just for SO, right? Okay. This, this um, kind of dots, or these three dots, is the structure we see in the continuum. As for the continuum, I cannot tell you what is the origin of the continuum because the spectral index is two, and um, there are several options. We still need to figure out what the continuum is made of. Um, the blue, the blue lines are the reconstruction of the mission from the OH masers, and the black lines are the brightness of the 13 CO. This is not a model of density or whatsoever; it's just the mission of thir in 13 CO reconstructed. Can you estimate the density, say, at the red? Whatever uh, the, the densities were estimated in the in our previous papers and okay. went from ten to the to the six in the equatorial part, but of course that depends on the resolution you have. If if you observe this object with Alma, it's a little bit north, but you probably get a different result. But on average, on 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 one arc second scales, you probably have ten to the six at the equator and ten to the fourth at the tips uh, of the equatorial walls. So factor, uh, factor 100 or but it, yeah. it, it could be larger i mean if you if you observe this with higher resolution you may find that uh, you know you have it be even more compact compact uh, central component and but if in these two regions that i mark now can can yeah. you say the density ratio not the peak the peak is low but say yeah uh, so factor 10 to maybe several tens maybe 20 several tens between these two regions yes yeah, yeah. okay, thank you very much and we had a question in the chat which i think is basically the same the same question about the mass in the different components so any any other questions uh, for example in this equatorial component we estimate that the mass i mean in all this thing um the mass was something like 0.6 solar masses, and the total mass in the nebula is 0.9. So that gives you an order. I mean, that gives you 
the numbers probably. Okay, so seems like we have no more questions. So thanks again, Javier. I think now sure. we have uh, another 10 minute break. So we come back on the hour for the, the next round of talks. Okay, thanks. We enter the home stretch of today's uh, talks with uh, Miguel Santander Garcia. Mig, are you there? Yes. And go ahead and share screen. Start when you're ready and I'll give you a two minute warning when you have two minutes left. Okay. Let me share the screen. Oh, sorry, I need to go log out and in again. Sorry. Okay, so maybe we can uh, move to next talk while you uh, try it's, and sort your... It will your... be a moment. Just, just start. Okay, so... <laughs> so we wait for Mick, just in case. Okay, sorry about that. Had to give permissions. So now, can you see the screen? Yes, we can. Okay, and the cursor? Okay, yes, so yep, we see it. Hi, everyone. I'm going to uh, present uh, the, our latest results. Uh, which will be submit to a journal over the course of this week, probably, if everything goes fine. And basically, uh, we are trying to answer a question we have been uh, having for some time, uh, which is basically, basically uh, how massive are uh, planetary nebula arising from common envelope evolution? And for that, this started with, uh, uh, with, uh, with uh, this thought experiment. Uh, very simple thought experiment comparing single star evolution with common envelope evolution. Uh, let's consider a, a single star, let's say 1.5 solar masses, uh, in which uh, most of the envelope uh, of the AGB envelope uh, is uh, deployed into the into the stellar medium, inter interstellar medium, and it's too diluted to be detected in the in the planetary nebula. The planetary nebula is rather the content of the, of the mass loss during the last few hundred to thousand years of the AGB stage. Now, if this star uh, had instead a, a close uh, binary companion, uh, then uh, its evolution would be interrupted during, at some point during the AGB. And all the mass, uh, let's say from one to 20 million years before, uh, before it, it would have ejected the the PN, all that mass should also be incorporated into the planetary nebula. So in short, planetary nebula arising from common envelope evolution uh, should in principle, a priori, uh, be more massive than, uh, than regular uh, planetary nebula uh, arising from single stars. Now, how massive are uh, post common envelope planetary nebula really? Uh, for uh, trying to answer this, uh, we tried uh, approximating the total mass as the uh, sum of the ionized and the molecular mass. We are neglecting uh, any neutral mass because we, in, in principle, we are we think it's very uh, it's likely to be very low, if any. And uh, we had an initial uh, sample of nine objects, which we expanded, uh, gathering uh, all possible data from the literature to. 21 objects, which represents like one fifth of the total known population of, of these objects. 
And we computed the ionized uh, masses in a systematic way uh, from uh, values of the density and temperature from the literature and also uh, systematized H alpha fluxes, fluxes, uh, the red end fluxes and sizes from uh, paper by David Fru and collaborators. And also we recomputed the molecular masses of uh, every object in the sample or upper limits as they were uh, underestimated traditionally. And we found that only three objects in, the, in a sample of 21 show any molecular emission uh, and those and thus have definite molecular masses. Uh, the rest are only upper limits. Now, uh, if we uh, compute all these masses, then we can make this plot, a plot like this, uh, plotting ionized mass versus molecular mass. And in, in this uh, plot, these lines uh, are lines of equal mass, let's say, and the further to the top and to the right, this uh, point, no, a nebula, uh, the more massive it will be. And here we can uh, distinguish between uh, nebula rising from a single degenerate systems, which you only have one uh, white dwarf, uh, uh, and a nebula which comes from double degenerate systems, which seem to be uh, twice as massive according to the, uh, geome their geometric means. Now, are, are post-common envelope uh, planetary nebula more uh, massive, really more massive than, than regular uh, planetary nebula? By regular planetary nebula, uh, I, I mean uh, simply planetary nebula, which are not known to be uh, part, uh, to be closed binaries, no? to host a closed binary. Now, we built a sample of these objects uh, from gathering uh, that, that data from the literature, uh, from uh, surveys, from uh, we, we gather data from 97 uh, objects, which uh, uh, follow, which fulfilled uh, some criteria like having a molecular, being molecularly observed, uh, having systematic and red and H alpha fluxes and size, sizes from the uh, David Fru's paper. And also since the instance is critical in mass determination, we only uh, selected objects with uh, accurate distance determinations uh, with either Gaia lower or uh, Gaia values or uh, objects that were used as calibrators for uh, the, the for Fruz et al. Uh, 2016 paper. And then we uh, systematically, systematically computed the ionized and molecular mass from all the sample. And then when, when you plot the results together in gray, now we have the regular uh, PN population, then uh, taking geometric means, uh, you realize that the single degenerate, the geometric mean is 0.14 solar masses, is the same as in the regular uh, PN case. And if you plot a histogram, this is a histogram uh, of the masses of these objects, from the, in red the single degenerates and in black the double degenerates, uh, you can try Plotting this together with all the population, all the known population, uh, the, these 97 objects plus the, the, the post-common envelope ones, then we can compare these uh, samples and extract some conclusions. Doing a case sample anderson darling test, uh, this tells us that there's a 95% probability that the double degenerates uh, and the regular uh, planetary nebula follow actually different distributions. They, they arise from different di population distributions. While, whereas the, the single degenerate and the regular PN population would follow the same distribution to a high confidence degree. So there are some differences. More differences, when you incorporate into the analysis uh, the expansion velocity of the nebula, this is a characteristic expansion velocity, of course, uh, things are in fact much more complicated than this, but uh, taking the characteristic ex expansion velocity from uh, mostly from surveys, from systematic surveys, uh, such as uh, that from Weinberger and that uh, by uh, Guerrero and, and collaborators, then uh, we can show that the post-common envelope uh, planetary nebula uh, show uh, slightly larger expansion velocities than the uh, regular uh, population. In fact, 
the, if we compute the linear momentum and the kinetic energy, we can make some comparisons. Uh, here we can uh, see that the linear momentum of the double degenerate systems and the kinetic energy are really uh, much larger than uh, than in the rest of the cases in the either the regular uh, planetary nebula or the single degenerate uh, planetary nebula. Up to a factor eight or so in kinetic energy and a factor four in linear momentum. So whereas the single degenerate system seems quite similar to the uh, to the planet, regular <coughs> planetary nebula almost in every respect, uh, PN arising from double degenerate systems seem significantly more massive and faster expanding than the rest. Now, uh, in, we can try to reconstruct the common envelope at the time of C uh, common envelope occurrence and in order to, to try to answer some questions like, like this. Uh, is the whole is actually the whole AGB envelope of the star ejected into the nebula? And also, how much of the energy budget coming from the orbital uh, shrinkage uh, is actually spent on unbinding, unbinding and accelerating the nebula? We were able to reconstruct the, the common envelope in a few systems uh, in which we have uh, available orbital parameters. Uh, in, in particular, two single degenerate cases and two double degenerate cases. And then we computed the efficiency alpha, the AGB envelope mass at the time of common envelope and uh, the, the energy budget and uh, how much of that envelope or the mass of the envelope is uh, the, the nebula actually represents. And also how much of the ener energy budget has actually been spent of unbinding and accelerating the nebula. And we can see that in this, the energy, uh, in every case, uh, the, the, the problem is basically the opposite to, to what we are uh, discussing, that we are lacking enough energy to, to unbind the, the, the envelope. In this case, in, in, in this, all these cases, uh, only a, a small fraction of the energy, orbital energy budget was uh, spent on, on uh, unbinding and accelerating the, the, the gas, the nebula. And also, uh, while in the case of double de degenerates, uh, the, mass of the, the, the mass of the nebula represents more or less the mass of the envelope uh, within, uh, within uncertainties. You could say that the whole AGB envelope is ejected in these systems, might be ejected, uh, in single degenerate systems, the fraction is much lower. Uh, like for example, in this first case, in which we have a 1.7 uh, solar mass in the envelope of the AGB at C uh, occurrence, and only 1% of that is contained in the visible nebula. So this leads to a very un uncomfortable question. That is that where is the rest of uh, the mass of this AGB envelope? Because here we are minutes. a lot of mass. Okay, thanks. Now, uh, for uh, wrapping up, uh, I have really more questions than answers. Uh, we have uh, tried uh, to, to well, we, we think that uh, while SD systems are as massive as regular uh, PN, uh, DD systems, double degenerate systems, are considerably more massive. And, and I, I, well, I don't know why would that be, but uh, it seems, so far, it seems like a trend. And also the DC uh, reconstruction of these four systems would hint towards the following. Uh, first of all, uh, we have a spare energy budget. Uh, the, the, the energy budget is not uh, fully spent. And also, while in uh, double degenerate systems, the whole AGB envelope could be unbound, uh, that is very difficult to say for uh, single degenerate systems. Uh, and this leads to this uh, problem that uh, we are missing a large, very large uh, amounts of mass there that we simply have no idea where they, uh, they, they could be. They, they shouldn't be in a halo much further out uh, of the, further beyond the, the nebula. And uh, this is all, thank you very much. Thank you, Mick. Uh, any questions?
or, or any answers, maybe, Mr. <laughs> We have a comment on Slack from Bruce. I can't help but wonder how we recognize a real post-common envelope planetary nebula with a core binary from their observables. That is, what are the characteristic shapes, expansion ages, kinematics, mass, momenta, total kinetic energy? I think that's, a, that's a, an interesting question because... Um, I think the more, in, the more interesting question is how do we tell the single star PN? Because there must be any number of planetary nebulae without a confirmed binary central star, but um, where we haven't yet identified the binary. So how can we fish those out? Uh, anyway, uh, Noam, you have a question? Yes, very interesting. and. <laughs> Uh, you raise many questions. First of all, my guess is that those uh, planetary nebulae from this regular sunburst that are similar to the single degenerate um, are actually also post-common envelope, but the companion is too low mass or already merged with the core. I, I'm not sure. Then I, I was not sure about your energy budget. Did you include in the uh, unbinding the envelope, only the end mass that you see, or did you include in it the envelope mass that you estimate? Because in one planetary nebula, in the single degenerate, what you called, there you estimated the envelope mass as 1.7, but uh, mm -hmm. in the nebula, there is only what 1% of it. So when you, wh wh where is the alpha common envelope efficiency here? Is the FE? Hey. Well, the, the, the efficiency is calculated the normal way, so okay. leave it aside. But the unbinding energy for the actual nebula uh, is calculated uh, without uh, this remaining mass. So we suppose that the, this mass that is missing is not there, it's somewhere else. And uh, you just have the, the core mass, the, the, the present day uh, core mass, and uh, the uh, and the the mass of the nebula, this which is 0.02 solar masses or something like that, and this it's just the unbinding energy of that of those 0.02 solar masses. It's a okay, so, estimation. So the 0.6 percent is the energy to eject uh, to eject what you see 0 0.02 solar masses. Yes, it, but it's to the point eject to... the entire. To eject the entire envelope, you need thirty uh, percent. Well, it yeah, in the, it, it, this is just the the energy to uh, spend to uh, to unbind the the observed nebula, the 0.02 solar masses, and accelerate it to the kinetic energy that we observe based on its characteristic uh, expansion velocity. Yes. Yeah, so yeah, the, 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 there are several possibilities, uh, but. Yeah, one of them is that we don't see the main ejection of the envelope, as, as, as you said. We, we only see part of the envelope. Maybe initial ejection was in the beginning of the common envelope or outside the common envelope, and only later the system entered the common envelope. But with solo mass of 0 0.02, it might be that everything was ejected, and only later the main sequence companion lost its mm. mass that it accreted, 0 0.02, and the, 0 0.02, and this is a nebula that we see. I don't know. But, yeah, we, you know. we, we were wondering actually if if uh, if a model like like the grazing envelope evolution by by yourself uh, could actually explain somehow uh, this phenomenon uh, in 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 the way that it could be episodic and not uh, only once uh, occurrence very quickly and 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 that's it. But uh, it's very difficult to say. <laughs> Yeah, if, if, if you have common envelope and then the AGB contracts and later, later expand and then you have a final common envelope. I don't know. They're very interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so if there are no more questions, then we can pass to the, the talk of Nick. Nick, are you here? I'm here. Can you hear me okay? okay. Yeah, we can hear you. Mick, can you stop sharing, please? Uh, if... I, there. Yeah, there we go. Okay, Nick, go ahead. 
Again, I'll give you a two minute warning when you have two minutes left. Okay, you should be able to see my slide. Yep, we can see you fine. We can see you fine. Great. Okay, so hello. Uh, my name is Nick Chorney. I'm a PhD student at the University of Cambridge. Uh, this is some work um, with my supervisor, Nick Walton, and also uh, with David Jones and others. And um, so today I'll be talking about um, identifying candidate close binary central stars or close common envelope central stars of planetary nebulae using data from the Gaia mission. So Gaia um, is the ESA mission that's conducting um, precision space-based astrometry, at least that's what it's best known for, um, so positions and parallaxes and proper motions for nearly 2 billion stars in the Milky Way. Um, it also offers us photometry in three different pass bands, a broad P band and a blue BP and red RP bands. And the way Gaia works um, as it scans the sky means that we each uh, each star is observed many times, um, typically in um, pairs of observations separated by a few hours and then repeated every couple of months. And it's these repeated uh, photometric observations that mean that Gaia um, can facilitate studies of photometric variability, which is what we're interested in here. Um, so there's a whole different subject of how do you actually um, identify central stars of planetary nebulae and Gaia. Um, for that, I'll uh, point you to our um, 2020 paper. There's also an OMS talk on YouTube. But it's, we have a, basically an automated method using the um, color and positional information to um, cross-match um, central star detections in Gaia against known planetary nebulae. And this yields a catalog of around um, 1,500 um, central star and also compact PN detections, uh, in this case in Gaia ER2. So what we're going to do is, the idea is to use um, the photometric uncertainty um, that's published by Gaia uh, to identify variable objects. And the photometric uncertainty that Gaia publishes is based on the uh, observed scatter in the repeated measurements that it takes. So if an object is, uh, if an object is constant, then the scatter is just due to the intrinsic measurement uncertainty. But if an object is variable, um, this will also add to the scatter. And um, if it's significant, if the variability has a large enough amplitude, this will be identifiable as um, excess photometric uncertainty in Gaia. And what, when the uncertainty is dominated by the variability, we can actually use the photometric uncertainty from Gaia uh, to recover the variability amplitude. And what we find is that many uh, known close binary systems um, show large variability amplitudes in Gaia. And this plot on the right is a selection of around um, 700 um, central stars of extended um, PN with reliable Gaia matches. On the x-axis is the Gaia broadband magnitude. On the y-axis is this um, variability amplitude, which is derived from the um, photometric uncertainty. And the colored points are known or um, suspected binary systems. Uh, the ones most interesting for, um, for this talk being the red dots, which are um, short period binaries. And you can see that most of the known short period systems um, lie above the, the general trend. So there's some 
Uh, as you'd expect, there's some dependence on the photometric uncertainty with the, uh, with the brightness of the object, but um, the known short period um, systems are sort of clear, clear outliers with much, much, larger, um, much larger uncertainties. And so, as we, as we probably know, the um, photometric variability in close binary systems can come from a number of different effects. Um, you have irradiation when um, the cool companion is, um, is heated on one side, um, ellipsoidal modulation or tidal distortion, and if you're lucky, you also have eclipses. And so again, looking um, using the uh, photometric uncertainty as a proxy for the, for the amplitude of the variability, um, on this plot we can see that, the, as we'd expect, the irradiated systems are the ones that have the um, highest amplitudes, while the uh, lipsoidally modulated or tidally distorted ones um, tend to have much, uh, much lower uh, variability amplitudes. And then there's many systems that are detected purely spectroscopically, so only through radio velocity variations. Most of those do not show any photometric uncertainty where they follow the um, general trend. Um, now, what we're interested in is using, um, using this variability to identify um, select candidate uh, variable central stars, which um, could be indicative of there being uh, close binary systems. And uh, the problem we run into is that the, um, this intrinsic photometric uncertainty in Gaia is going to depend on uh, the properties of the source, its magnitude and its color, as well as however many times it's been observed by Gaia and um, other complicated factors. Um, so basically we can make some um, simplifying assumptions and um, use those to derive this um, color and magnitude independent um, significance parameter. Um, so to select objects from Gaia, that have uh, variability that is larger than you would typically expect to see for other for a constant star of that color and brightness, and um, those lines of kind of where the threshold of significance is um, are indicated the dotted and dashed lines on the plot on the right, and the um, the objects that are um, outlined in dark black circles are, are those that are show um, large variability significance. Um, so there's, um, of course, there's other possibility, possible explanations for um, large uncertainties in Gaia. Um, so the, the photometry in the G band is related to PSF fitting. And if you have an object that's not, but where the PSF fit isn't very good, um, possibly because it's a partial, it's actually a partially resolved double or an extended object like many planetary, neb planetary nebulae are. Um, this will affect both the um, astrometry, so both the um, location, the how Gaia tries to uh, fit the location of the source and also its photometry, so how Gaia um, measures the flux of that object. And that will that can manifest as um, excess uncertainty. These poor fits can manifest as excess uncertainty in the photometry. And there's other effects such as nearby bright stars, bright nebulae, and so on that can also impact these photometric uncertainties. And and these are quite hard to account for. Um, one thing that we can look at is the um, since Gaia um, measures uh, fluxes in multiple pass bands. Um, if we're trying to verify that um, some uh, uncertainty we see is actually due to variability and is genuine, and we can also compare that to, um, to the uncertainties in these other bands. Um, so on the figure on the right, um, in the top, um, so it's showing the variability, for example, in the BP pass band versus that in G. Um, there's some relation you expect to see for, for constant sources where um, 
that's traced by the sort of gray objects on the upper left. Um, and then there's quite a narrow, um, for the objects that are truly variable, they trace quite a narrow locus um, through this parameter space. And there are also some objects where um, the variability is much higher in the, in the broadband than in the, the wider band. And this is related, seems to be sort of astrometric fitting errors rather than, um, rather than genuine variability. Um, so this gives us, um, so, so the idea is we, we use those, we use that to filter, um, refine our selection. Um, and when all is said and done, um, we've, we've identified around 60 objects that show um, significant variability in the Gaia data that are not known. To Two be, minutes, Nick. Yep. Not known to be close binary systems. Um, some of these are known variables for other reasons. Um, there are pulsations, spots, um, or other types of long-term variability. Um, but the selection that we've used for these candidates also recovers um, 75 percent of the known close binaries um, in this sample that we've defined, which is um, extended objects that have um, confident Gaia matches and good astrometry. So there's some hope that uh, many of these variable objects are in fact new um, post common envelope binary systems. So to confirm those, we need time series photometry. Um, with Gaia, we only get time series photometry for sources that Gaia's own classifier has classified as variable. Um, this has a very low recall. It only recovers four known um, binary systems, um, but it also does recover um, four of these candidate variables that we've identified in BR2. All of those show um, relatively high amplitude sinusoidal um, oscillation consistent with radiation effects. And then um, what we're working on um, at the moment is an ongoing uh, ground-based follow-up campaign um, for the, all of these sources that don't have Gaia-like curves. Um, we need to both to confirm that the, they are in fact variable and also that the variability is um, periodic and consistent with binarity. Is there many other um, even if the, the variability is genuine, there are others, other um, sources of variability, such as pulsations, that, um, that uh, would also be detected in Gaia, particularly as you go to lower amplitudes. Um, so where does this ultimately get us? Um, hopefully it, it helps with um, population constraints and that we have um, sort of a selection of objects that's um, uniform and unbiased in some way, uh, where the survey isn't, for example, dependent on the uh, morphologies of the, the PN. But of course, there's lots of asterisks next to that, where now it depends on the Gaia selection function, um, still on our limitations of our ability to follow it up from the ground. Um, and once we do, once we have done these follow-ups and whatever we've discovered, it'll yield yet another um, orbital period distribution. Um, but I should note that for the, um, even if everything that we, we discovered uh, identified here does turn out to be a binary system, it would still be broadly consistent with the 20% sort of um, binary fraction that we, um, the other, um, other surveys such as Ogle and Kepler have found. Um, the other thing that we hope this will yield um, is just interesting individual objects. The nice thing about Gaia, especially as compared to um, Ogle and Kepler, is that it has all sky coverage. And it means that we'll find, we expect to find more systems that are nearby, and brighter, and have well constrained distances. Um, and these offer a rich, um, richer opportunities to. Um, fully model them and thus provide better constraints on um, on models. Um, so there's more details about the uh, selection um, um, in our first paper, um, uh, just published this year, and then um, look out next year, hopefully, for um, a follow-up paper on the results of our, um, our follow-ups. Thank you very much.
Okay, thanks a lot, Nick. <clears throat> There's uh, one question in the Slack, which is maybe maybe more of a question for me than for than for Nick, but from Priscilla, she says, um, "Do all PNE with density enhancements in the equator, in the equator, like tori, come from binary systems?" <clears throat> so, I don't think we can say that definitively, but uh, certainly there was there's a very nice paper from Brent Michelski in 2009, following his work on the Ogle survey, where he looks at the morphologies of um, planetary nebulae with binary central stars and shows that there is a, a tendency which is much stronger amongst post-common envelope binary uh, planetary nebulae than in the general planetary nebula population to have uh, bipolar structures, to have nebula, to have toroidal wastes, and also to have uh, low ionization structures. So I would uh, say that not all come from binary. Some come from triple star systems. <laughs> and, and quadruples and quintuples. Well, yeah, but you know, it's lower probability. So uh, any other questions? And I should also say on top of that, that similarly, just as um, Following on from that work from, from Brent Michelski, we also, in collaboration with Brent and other people, spend a lot of time following up photometrically uh, planetary nebulae that have uh, morphologies like that, equatorial uh, tori, in the hope of showing that they are a better pre-selector for, for binarity and uh, had a lot more success in discovering binary stars. But that was a very biased survey, so we can't put a... a percentage on, on anything there. So we have in the in the chat from Bruce about the central star of uh, CRL 618. Would you like to comment more on that, Bruce? That was a note intended for you, David, uh, based on what you said at the opening of the talk. I don't think it's of general interest. Okay. Sure. Then uh, any other questions for Nick? We also have time allocated now for a general discussion. So uh, if you don't have specific questions for Nick, you can also ask questions to the other speakers or make a, a general, general point. If not, I have a, a slide that I can put up to try and drive some, some discussion, I hope. So anybody? Okay, then I guess not. I guess everybody's tired now. So let me stick my slide here. <clears throat> so wait, wait a moment, please. <laughs> I well, I, I can comment on something on, on Bruce's uh, question on, on Slack. Go ahead. Uh, just to, to, to clarify, uh, the the double degenerates are the ones who show absolutely no molecular mass, not at all, not a single system. The only molecular mass we uh, have detected is in three uh, single degenerate systems. They are commenting on that comment by, by Bruce. So Miguel, uh, you're quite right, and and I apologize for. Uh, being no, a little bit I, off the I, mark I did, there. I didn't say that in the in the talk. Um, I, I guess my comment is really more general than that. It, it applies also to what we heard from Javier. And, that, you know, in general, um, molecular images return values, from, I think, between 0.05 and 0.2 solar masses in molecular gas. And I'm just pointing out that that gas may have been there for a long, long time, and that fast winds just slam into it and make it visible. Yeah, but uh, the, the, the gas that has been there for a long, long time shouldn't be uh, diluted because it has been expanding at some velocity. So it depends on the time, on what time frame are we speaking about. I guess. 
And nonetheless, the, the common envelope episode should unbind a significant fraction of the envelope because it's whatever's left should unbind that in one fell swoop. So the fact that they don't seem to be at all more massive seems to either say that there are there is a continuous depletion of the envelope or that some of that envelope has already been uh, is somewhere else. So have you, I think you have you heard uh, yeah, uh, yeah, it was a com it was a comment on on this thing of the remnant remnant AGB being pushed uh, the post AGB phase. I mean, there are cases in in, in which this is clear. I mean, you see uh, CRL six eighteen, CRL twenty six eighty eight, NGC twenty seventy twenty seven, where you see even in the optical in the scatter light you see these arcs, which is just you know. The, the, the quasi spherical, well, let's see, a spherical plus um, this is spiral waves due to the fact that there is a binary at the heart of the uh, of the system, and but it's quasi spherical. And then you see the bipolar uh, thing ramming into this envelope. But there are other cases in which there is no sign at all of anything from the AGB whatsoever. There is no scatter light. There is no um, there is no nebulosity in the infrared. There is absolutely nothing. This clear sky and then uh, the shape of the post AGB nebulae. And if you if, if you take this nearly half solar mass, uh, you divide by the huge. I mean, the highest mass loss you can really um, drive through uh, radiation pressure. That that's what is working at the AGB phase. You end up with an H. Then you multiply by 10 kilometers per second, and you see that this huge amount of mass should be very, very extended. And there is nothing left at those distances. So there may be some AGB, but part of this mass that the, we see in this very massive protoplanetary has been ejected in some short amount of time. There's no way out. I mean, in some cases, there, there is this uh, interplay between the AGB phase and the post-AGB winds. That's clear. And in some other cases, we don't see any trace of the AGB. We can assume there was an AGB wind down there, but it was pretty, pretty faint in comparison what, uh, to what we see right now. What is the mass of the nebulae in these cases that you say no AGB? We need it massive more than, you know, 0.1? More than uh, mass? Uh, more than 0.1, yes. Yeah. Uh, not, notice that um, in these days it's not longer true, but uh, I mean, those guys that we know from 10 years back or 20 years back, we, we were only detecting the most massive ones, probably are the tip of the iceberg. Maybe they don't represent the whole population, but uh, this, has been, this has been to be worked out in a proper way. I mean, um, saying that post AGBs contain between 0.1 solar mass to one solar mass uh, is probably not true anymore. In particular, uh, the post EGB around binaries, these Keplerian things, um, we can also measure the mass in the nebula in, in the disk, plus in the wind that is emanating from this disk, and the masses are always pretty small. They, they don't reach even the 0.1 solar mass. So those are totally different. Steve, I think you had your hand up next. I had a question for Javier. Um, have you observed uh, CS? Uh, yes, I did observe CS in this guy too, yes. Okay, uh, because you, you didn't mention that one. No, we don't. I mean, uh, we have two works that are going to be published. One is a full... Uh, three millimeter, two millimeter, one millimeter survey with the 30 meter that covers everything from 85 gigahertz up to 270. And then we have several lines of CS, SO, I mean, many more molecules. And then 
by having a look at the um, single disc profiles, we realized that the, they, they came in three different flavors. Uh, there were profiles that resembled those of CO and 13CO, those that were much narrow, and those that were the narrow component plus only the tips, I mean, the high velocity tips of the CO. So there were kind of a triple shape, triple peak shapes. So when we designed the NOEMA observations, we, we select a band that, what, that cover at least one species representative of these three examples. And in fact, for the, um, for the let's say, species that trace shocks or that can be enhanced by shock chemistry, uh, like um, SIO, SO, SO2, CS, we only managed to map um, SO, SO2, and I think that was it, because there, it was impossible to do that. Um, I mean, not using a lot of, I mean, huge amount of time. The, this this uh, NOEM observation was already as um, uh, 32 hours, which is kind of a um, big program. Yeah, that's kind this, of a lot. the instrument, yeah. Um, and then by using these two settings, we managed to get 13CO, C17O, uh, C18O, C and then HCN, HCO+, plus, N2O, H+, plus, and, and the, 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 the sulfur bearing molecules, but not CS. Okay, no, because uh, the reason I was asking was about uh, the possibility of seeing also maybe a species of hot excitation by, uh, by electrons that might be leaking from, from the shocks. But um, well, I'm not the expert on the chemistry of the of the guy. I mean, I'm, I'm, we have some of the guys trying to do the chemistry, and the idea was to to pull all these species. But CS was uh, was not was impossible to put CS in the band without losing uh, something mm -hmm. uh, more important. But but this guy has CS, has SIO and um, SO plus. It, there, there's some, some ions, some radicals, and some molecules not typical of, of oxygen-rich environments. But this, this, this is normal if you have a PDR or you have shocks, because then the chemistry is not in equilibrium anymore. And then you, you may have molecules more typical of carbon-rich environment, even if your object is oxygen-rich. And the only other quick question was, do you have any idea of the filling factors for any of these species? Uh, for those where, where we have the, uh, the maps, uh, we have assumed a filling factor of one because we resolve the staff. But of course, we are not 100% sure, for example, that the, the central condensation that we see is, is indeed smaller than the beam. But typically, um, uh, for these torus and for the walls of the two lobes. And I mean, with Noema, you get a filling factor of nearly one. I mean, we are, um, uh, the, the features we see are uh, bigger than the beam size. So we are mapping, we are resolving the stuff. Okay. Thanks. Thanks very much. Just beautiful stuff. <laughs> okay, Alexi, you have your hand up. Uh, yeah, thank you. So uh, this is just uh, mainly to comment to what Javier and uh, you, David, were talking about before, so namely about the morphology and the masses in the nebulae. Uh, so the thing is that if we, if we run a population of binaries with the binary style evolution code, we find that the nebulae can be produced from binaries not only through common envelopes, but also through uh, stable mass transfer. And the mass in stable mass transfer can also be ejected pretty quickly. In other words, there are a wide binary is expected surrounded by nebulae of, of about one solar mass, which have lost that one solar mass over a course of 100 years or 1,000 years or even 10,000 years. Uh, so uh, perhaps one question would be whether we have any observational biases towards not detecting the wide binary companion in such cases. And uh, one important comment, which I would like to add to that, is that if, if a stably transferring system, the one which does not do common envelope, but loses one solar mass of material, over this course of hundreds of thousands or tens of years, the duration over which this mass is lost could determine the morphology or could be strongly correlated to the morphology of the nebula. So for example, if the mass is lost over a hundred years, that could be quite well, for example, just bipolar. If it's lost over 10,000 years instead, it could well be both bipolar and ring-shaped. So uh, there's also that degree that this subclass of 
nebulae could be quite much correlated to, um, or could, could be quite much uh, originating from the stable mass transfer system. Well, we do know of a handful of, uh, of wide systems. I mean, by, by wide, how wide is wide? Oh, well, meaning like above a few tens of days at least. So, yeah, in this, this sort of uh, graveyard for the, the common envelope, we don't really have, in terms of uh, planetary nebula central stars, very much in between, say, 10 days and a few hundred days. Beyond that, there are a, a handful that we found um, mm. where the, they're easier to study because the companion is giant, so it's uh, brighter and you can study it for longer. So there's a number of systems that we discovered uh, with the Makata, for example, uh, following them for, for 10 years radio velocity. But in this um, sort of intermediate period range, it seems as though while there are some systems there, there certainly aren't many. Um, so, so sounds what, like could it could it be that they these are the systems that instead evolve into the Van Winkle objects? Oh well, I mean, so the thing is that stars like the Sun they tend to have I mean post stable mass transit, they tend to have at least a few hundred days orbit and larger, but uh, stars which are larger than two solar masses or three solar masses they can end up at about a hundred days or so. Um, but but my question really is like if if you look at uh, systems which have a few hundred days orbit, right? So do we have any observational biases towards not seeing the companions or not identifying them as binaries? Well, that depends on the masses. So we certainly won't see them photometrically, mm. but then uh, depending on the masses, we should, in some cases, be sensitive to them uh, in terms of radio velocities. And while there have been a few, so Brent Michelski has, has found a few with a survey um, uh, with SALT. And then we've identified a couple that might be in that sort of range because they are uh, barium stars. But otherwise, I mean, Orsula did a, a fairly extensive survey of radio velocities and found that everything is variable, but nothing is periodic, mm. unless it's very short period. I mean, there are there are biases against it because of low amplitude and faintness and whatever. But I mean, it does seem that uh, there is a definite uh, lack of systems, at least in the shorter end of that. So mm -hmm. say 10 to 50 days, there's definitely nothing there. Okay. So at least it would be nice to to connect the statistics of populations of the two types and the and single progenitors as well, I suppose. Yeah, just. So any more comments? I guess I don't know. Uh, Noam Tomek? Yeah, yeah I, I can comment. I, I would like to say first a few words for Howard Bond. Howard Bond is a guy that looks like V8 V8 Moon in the nice picture who is working for tens of years before I entered the field of binary stars. And I'm very happy that he's participating here. Maybe he will say a few words. And so now let me refer to your slide. So theories, this is what I want from you. Uh, what about pre-common envelope evolution? Well, there are several studies by my group and others about it. It's very important. I mean, First of all, there is spin off by the companion of the giant star, which is important. Then there is mass transfer and mass loss before that. And for a long time, the pre-common envelope evolution might be stable, getting uh, unstable only later on for different reasons. For example, it can be eccentric at the beginning and only at periastron you lose mass. And some systems do not get even to the common envelope, some systems are on the border. And there's lots of work about this. And uh, whatever, I mean, there is mass transfer, mass loss, lots of mass loss before the common envelope. Not in all cases. Some cases are unstable from the beginning, so they get to the common envelope immediately. But some system will be stable. Mass, uh, the mass transfer will be stable. They will be stable uh, uh, to the Darwin instability and so on. So this is very, very important, very hard, I think, to simulate about the grazing envelope. I think if you see bipolar structure, which is massive and but what ejected before it might hint of the grazing envelope evolution. I think this system post, post AGB, which are orbital period of 100 days to 300 days. I think there's some kind of uh, grazing envelope uh, there. 
Um, as for the system that you don't see much mass uh, that Miguel discussed, I think we need to, to further emphasize that the common envelope evolution is not smooth evolution. It can be, be there must be, as, either the first phase is grazing envelope, that the companion with the jets remove. And in that sense, single degenerate can launch jet. White dwarf cannot launch jet because the moment they quit a little bit, start burning and build their own envelope. So they can launch jets and they can acquit a little bit mass. And it's very interesting in this system, what the, in the single degenerate, if you have any indication of accretion uh, into the single, uh, maybe uh, you're the chair and, and Joel can answer this if, if you see evidence. And I think we're getting to the point that we understand that the final common envelope evolution, and I have a paper devoted only to the final evolution, might be a long process. Amit Kashi who is here and I, when we talked about this post-common envelope circumbinary disk in some models, which are not clearly fit planetary nebulae because they're more eccentric and so on, the, the disk mass was 0.3 of the, of the binary mass, which is, can amount to 0 0.3, 0 0.4 solar masses. And the evolution can be 10 to the 4, 10 to the 5 years by the time but by, by that time you disperse the common envelope that you ejected. So I think a main issue from the first day, I think, from different talks, is that uh, also post-IGB that have circumbinary disk, and we had a talk on that, that circumbinary disk at the end of the common envelope evolution can postpone the time of ionization of the nebula. And by that time, we might have only a small and bipolar nebulae that was ejected. This final evolution uh, of the post-common envelope is a circumbinary, which as far as evolution might be similar to the post-AGB um, with circumbinary disk. This system have 100 to 300 days orbital period, while post-common envelope evolution is one to three days. But they might be similar, but less mass. So. I, I think I think the exit for the common envelope. Here, uh, Dave, you you brought the question: What about pre-common envelope? And I think post-common envelope evolution, not post-common, the final phase of the common envelope evolution, deserves its own uh, study, if not its own meeting. This is it. I spoke to. Well, I would I would I would stress that both do because I think so. The the post-common envelope definitely is uh, complicated, right? But the from my standpoint, as a simple observer, it seems to me that the pre-common envelope should be something that we're capable of, of understanding. And yet, for example, whenever we think about alpha, whenever we think about the efficiency, we ignore anything that happens before. No, no, we no, assume... no, we didn't ignore. We, I have a paper with a little bear on that. Okay, you, well, of course, you don't, you don't mass ignore, mass but every, mass everybody mass else... the common envelope can help you with the alpha parameter and launching so, okay. jets can help you. So all these- So maybe, the maybe you don't, but it seems to me that everybody else does. Okay, and the same for uh, mass loss and mass transfer. Maybe you don't, but it seems everybody else does because whenever anybody calculates alpha, there is the assumption that the mass of the secondary never changes, that the entirety of the envelope of the primary is there. And when we do, uh, I mean, hydro is difficult, okay? I appreciate that, but whenever we make hydrodynamic models, we artificially place the companion on the edge of the envelope of the complete primary. No, it's, I mean, it's difficult, but this, it seems to me that we should be able to trace this phase to, of significant, probably wind row slope overflow prior to entering into the, into the common envelope. Yeah, we don't, we don't ignore it. We put everything in the lambda parameter. We, we, hide, we hide physics in parameters. This is... <laughs> so I think Alexi wants to comment on, on that. No, I just want to say that we kind of ignore and don't ignore because the different, uh, different models to which, which work to different degree of detail. So I mean, the most simple models, for example, in pop synthesis, they really indeed have a star with stellar mass and radius, and perhaps they don't evolve the star until they apply the common pres prescription. But 
if one model's evolution with, say, MESA code, wherein the st structure is evolved, I mean, usually the evolution is carried on with MESA until some criterion is satisfied. For example, mass transfer rate exceeds some really critical value of 10 to the minus second. Um, so MESA's PR or something like that. So the star has evolved to some quite good extent. And then after that, the communal prescription is applied. And so in that sense, people do care about what happens before the communal onset. For example, uh, in MESA, you could trace, I mean, evolution of how the star loses first 0.05 or 0.1 solar masses before it starts common envelope evolution. So you could actually say at which rate, at what time those are lost, and you could actually make profiles. And if common envelope was really like launching jets, the jets would interact with that CSM and that could actually lead to some signatures. I mean, for example, like it would be observable. I mean, like people model actually. Uh, so just, just to comment that some models actually do uh, care about what happens before the common envelope. <laughs> And any response to the first question I put there? You've, you've theorists, you have defended yourself against my requests. So what, from the observational standpoint, I mean, the, classically, what we are always asked for is uh, masses and periods, because those are the most comparable to any kind of uh, population synthesis code. And as I put there, masses are easily the hardest thing for us to get, at least at the precision that's required to compare against any kind of population synthesis, while periods are, simple, are definitely easiest. So what else can we provide in terms of observables that uh, are useful in estimate, uh, models? Estimate of the equation of mass onto the companion, if you can do it. it I think it is very complicated. But at least tell us that there was some equation. Yeah, so this is so. I mean, this is perhaps partially connected to where we can do the chemistry. So when we have, for example, the carbon dwarf companion yeah. to the necklace, we can estimate the level of accretion there, and uh, we can, based on the radii, the level of inflation. You can make some estimate, but that depends heavily on the accretion rate as well. So there's a degeneracy between accretion rate and total accretion. Uh, Morgan? I, I, you mentioned the velocities, and I have this feeling that there's just a tremendous amount of information encoded in those kinematics that uh, I have no idea how to make full use of right now. But uh, when we can measure those, and I think about comparing a simulation, say, something that you have in the simulation is three-dimensional kinematics, and you may not have a perfect approximation for the ionization states. You may not have a perfect approximation for the thermodynamics, but to some extent, we can often make approximations that are good enough to understand some of the kinematics. And so I, I love that suggestion because it ties into the, one of the aspects that we can be more certain of in the, in like a gas dynamics model. Um, so if we can figure out how to like capture things at similar stages and make use of that information, then I think that could be a lovely path forward. Um, yeah, and I'd I be curious to hear what other people so have this, to say. This ties, in a, this ties in a little bit, I think, with, um, with Guillermo's models. Exactly. Because, uh, there's, there's a lot of models of the CE itself, but not so many that evolve it sufficiently to get to a stage where we can actually compare those observables. Right. And, and I... I not just magnet, not just MHD, but also uh, radiation hydrodynamics as well. Exactly, and and that's sort of I, I was thinking of Yamano Sak as as you know I was raising this and 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 also Noam's comment that like how these phases end, of course, matters for what the quote unquote answer is, but it also matters for what we see during this potentially long phase. Um, so. Uh, that could be a really interesting thing to explore further. And, and with the caveat that I have no idea what the right, like, way to make that comparison instantly is. Anybody else? If not, uh, I think we're probably reaching our time limit. No? So... Maybe just we have till 10 past, but we can end now or wait two minutes. Maybe somebody will have any other <laughs> comments, young people. Then. Well, maybe I can take the opportunity to thank all of the speakers for their excellent talks and everybody for their questions. I think it's been a really interesting 
discussion both after the talk both after the talks and uh, and right now so thank you everybody and again thanks Noam and Tomek for, for taking the lead on organizing this and if that hasn't flushed out any more comments or questions then everybody remember that you have the the slack available 24 hours a day you can leave your question whenever you want tag the person to whom you are asking and I'm sure they'll They'll see it and try and get back to you. Thank you.